gun shot. Okay, uh, is the mic light? Yes. Yes, you'll be all right. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So today, I have the pleasure of, you know, kicking off uh, you know, second town hall forum event. The topic is regional planning. I hope you, know, you guys can hear me. You know, we are competing with a couple of things today. Uh, football and parking is a right back here, so uh, we're working through that. Um, first and foremost, I would like to welcome everybody to this event. Thank you for taking two precious hours of your time to be here with us. I know Sunday is you know, important, and thanks for coming. People often ask me, what is better you know? Right? Let me try to answer it as best as I can. Better Cook you know, is a grassroots level organization made of volunteers from the community, focused on informing and empowering residents about developments around us, driving transparency and accountability in the local elected office, such as you know, city council and uh, school board, supporting sensible growth aligned with the needs and interests of majority of residents. There is no official membership there are no office barriers, there is no art structure. It's a flat group of like-minded volunteers. If you identify with Better Cupertino's mission, you are already part of Better Cupertino. <coughs> the best way to think of Better Cupertino would be the open source community in the tech industry, right? Everybody contributes for the greater good of the community. Right? That's how the open source community works. Better Cupertino is not a country club that decides what's good for residents. It puts information in residents' hands for them to decide for themselves. Oftentimes, it's the information that's, that's hidden. <coughs> Some vested interests would like to paint Better Cupertino as a no-growth group. That's far from the truth. Better Cupertino did not object to projects like you know, Marina Flyer, two recent hotel GPAs, and the Hamptons. Like, they indeed support those projects. You can donate to Better Cupertino at www.bettercupertino.org to support our activities. A well-informed community is in the best interest of all of us. Cupertino Connect is a publication from Better Cupertino to keep residents informed. You can sign up to receive monthly newsletter and important announcements at www.bettercupertino.org or at www.cupertinoconnect.com. You can pick up hard copies, you know, at the front desk as well. Next, I would like to thank the sponsors of this event. Without their financial support, we couldn't bring this event to the community. Our special thanks to premium business sponsors, Ivy Max Learning Center and Springlight Education Institution, business sponsor Citizen Marine, Save My Sunny, Sunny Sky, Silicon Valley Community United, also known as SVCU. Personal sponsors, Alan Penn, Greg Schaefer, Muni Madhipatla, Meena Shu, and Nielsen Buchanan. They, they contributed financially to help make this happen. Thanks to the panelists and elected officials from Bay Area cities and their representatives in the audience. If I may ask, you know, those in the audience, you know, elected officials and their representatives, can you please stand up and introduce yourself for the rest? Hi, everyone. My name is Yvonne. I'm from Senator Jim Bell's office. And I'm Tom Pike. I'm from Congressman Rokana's office. And it's a pleasure to be here today. Thanks. I'm Michael Bolden. I'm a city councilperson for Sunnydale. And I'm Anybody else? Eric Hill says City Council Ballot. City Council Ballot, thank you. This is just for elected officials only, right? Or uh, their representatives. Okay. Nice. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, since the topic is regional planning, I believe you know we have residents from various neighboring cities, right? Cupertino, Sunnyvale, San Jose, Santa Clara, Saratoga, Palo Alto. East Palo Alto and East Menlo Park. East Palo Alto and East Menlo Park. Thank you. Fremont. <laughs> San Jose. Yep, San Jose. Yeah. Santa Clara. 
I'd like to thank two special guests from Marine County, Stephen Nestel and Susan Kirsch. They have come all the way from Marine to participate in this event. They are founding members of Citizen Marine, a grassroots level organization like Barbutino. And of course, they've been there longer than Barbutino. Thank you for coming. We also have representation from grassroots groups such as Silicon Valley Transit Users, Palo Alto for Sensible Zoning, Real Community of East Palo Alto and the East Menlo Park, Save Marine Wood, Citizen Marine, a parent organization of all activist groups in, in the Marine County, Save My Sunny Sky of Sunnyvale and Cupertino. Our moderator today, Dr. Yang Shao, is a well-accomplished individual. He is working as Director of Protein Chemistry at Lake Pharma in San Francisco. He is also Vice President of, and elected board member and Vice President of Board of Trustees at Fremont Unified School District. He has Master's and Doctoral degrees from Harvard University in Organic Chemistry and Chemical Biology. Thank you, Dr. Shao, for volunteering to moderate this event for us today. Without further ado, Dr. Shao, take it away. Thank you, Muni, for the kind introduction. And uh, it's an honor for me to be here as the moderator for such a wonderful forum, uh, regional planning. As you know, uh, by sitting in the school board, we always face the challenge of student housing. And that has everything to do with the overdevelopment of Fremont. So um, once again, uh, welcome to today's forum. Let me introduce our panelists today. From your left to right, first, <coughs> Mr. Kenson Chu, California Assemblyman, AD 25. covers Santa Clara, San Jose, Newark, Fremont, and Milpitas. And three months ago, he was appointed to be on the Economic Development Board of the State Assembly. Next is a Mr. Chappie Jones, Chappie. San Jose City Council Member. Next is uh, Mr. Richard Bernhardt, CEO of Bernhardt Communications and Strategy Corporation. <laughs> Last but not the least, Mr. Tom Du Bois, Palo Alto City Council member. <laughs> Today's forum will break into two parts. For the first hour, I will ask questions to the specialists from a list of prepared questions in order to give each and every panelist a fair chance to answer the questions and also to make sure we go through the prepared questions. We will time our panelists in order to keep time. And uh, we have a timer uh, in the front row and when the time is almost up, we will give you a warning. There's a 30 seconds left. And then when the time's up, please wrap up your response immediately. But the trick is, not every question is given this equal amount of time. Some are two minute questions, some are one minute questions, and some are three minute questions. So it is also a challenge for a timer to uh, give the signal. So the timer, please uh, sit n uh, even closer to the center so all the panelists <coughs> can see you clearly. After the first hour, we'll open the floor to the audience for the Q&A. And I will explain the rules when we come to that part. And now without further ado, let's begin the first part of today's forum. Question number one is a one minute question. One minute question. And the question is, what is 
regional planning. And what is your experience in regional planning? Let's start with Mr. Ken Sin Chu. Right. Well, good afternoon. It's really an honor to be here. Um, as I was driving up here, I was wondering, you know, uh, I live on the other side of the town. Why did they invite me to be here? But then when I see Dr. Yan Chao, I understand that we have uh, at least somebody from Fremont uh, uh, with me today. Uh, regional planning is, by its definition, uh, is really for the local government to have an opportunity to meet with your neighboring uh, cities or a county to dis define uh, the, the need for this region. And usually the regional planning uh, in, 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 in California, uh, uh, in South Bay, in, in the Bay Area, is done by the Association of Bay Area Government, ABAC. And uh, a little bit of background about myself. I served on the San Jose City Council, time is up. So, regional planning. Okay. That's, that's a lot to get in one minute. <laughs> First of all, I want to use a couple of seconds just to thank everyone for coming out and uh, participating in this, this forum and engaging in a constructive dialogue in terms of how we can identify uh, solutions to some of our problems. So hopefully I didn't use up too much of my time. <laughs> uh, but as far as what, um, what is regional planning, to me regional planning is planning across what we consider to be a mega region now. And it's the nine counties of the Bay Area as well as going into the Central Valley. A lot of the, the impacts that you're feeling in terms of your daily life are not just coming from a neighboring city, but it's coming from as far away as Hollister or uh, Stockton and some of the broader geographical areas. And my specific experience as far as regional planning is, one is I sit on the Seas Association uh, Executive Committee where we're involved with working with other cities to address a lot of the Santa Clara County regional issues as well as I was appointed to a subcommittee uh, for the, um, to allocate what they call arena numbers or housing allocation numbers to the various cities in Santa Clara County. So I'm part of that, that committee and I'm gonna be working with other cities to figure out how and where we put housing. So, and my time is up. Uh, thank you for having me today. The one thing that I saw in this audience is that we have a diversity of cities, and so that's sort of what regional planning is all about. Rarely do we have the opportunity to come together to discuss the major issues that happen city to city, county to county. And so the Bay Area is very much in need of that. And as a businessman, uh, someone who's been in business 30 years in the Bay Area, I see a real strong need for communication such as on things like infrastructure and transportation and schooling and the best ways in which uh, we can all interact. Without having that communication within cities and counties, uh, unfortunately impacts the quality of life and the ability for business to do business. I spent six years on Sunnyvale's Planning Commission um, and 10 years as the president of Sunnyvale's Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber of Commerce and the Planning Commission sort of should be on the same frequency just as city councils and chambers ought to be on the same frequency, but very often they don't talk at all. So my point with regional planning is to bring together those voices. Yeah, I, I do want to thank everybody for coming out and uh, thank you to the hosts. Um, so what's regional planning? Um, it's a challenge, that's what it is. Um, I'm involved in, uh, you know, it's really planning across kind of some of these artificial boundaries and, and Palo Alto being the northern part of Santa Clara County. Um, I think we see it quite a bit because uh, we see the interactions between San Mateo County and Santa Clara County, and that invisible line can be a challenge sometimes. Um, I'm involved with kind of several regional groups on the Caltrain uh, Local Policymakers Group, which is the entire uh, length of Caltrain. I'm also involved uh, the Grand Boulevard Initiative, which is looking at design standards for El Camino. Um, I'm on a Santa Clara Water Recycling which is uh, an effort between the Palo Alto Water Recycling Plan, which serves East Palo Alto, Los Altos, Stanford, Mountain View, and the Santa Clara Water District. And it's a good example, I think, of regional planning, looking at how we can uh, treat our wastewater and share it among cities. Um, 
kind of throughout Santa Clara County and even into San Mateo County. Thank you. As we know, most of the people care more about local planning. And talking about regional planning, they don't know much about it. So my next question would be a two-minute question. Do we need regional planning in the San Francisco Bay Area? If so, why and in what form? Let's start with Mr. Jones. So the answer is, is yes. We need, we need regional planning, and for the reasons that I articulated in my first response. What happens in San Mateo County, what happens in Palo Alto, what happens in uh, Contra Costa County, all impact us in terms of our quality of life. And if we don't have a coordinated regional strategy in terms of where the jobs go, where the housing is, where transportation is located. If there's not an uh, integrated, coherent strategy to address those, then we're going to get more of the same. Uh, a lot of the issues that we are facing in terms of our quality of life, are, particularly in the, in the West Valley, are people who are commuting from far distances to come to work in jobs in Cupertino and Santa, Santa Clara and Sunnyvale. But they live an hour, two hours away. And so that's impacting our our environment, it's impacting the quality of life for both the residents where these cars are going, coming through our neighborhoods and our, and our areas, as well as those commuters that have to commute long distances. So if we don't have a coordinated, integrated strategy in terms of how to get people closer to where they work and where they have to take fewer trips, have to get in their car less times, then we're going to get more of the same. Uh, I always use the example of people who are complaining about the increase in traffic that we're seeing. and. We have not had a major development in my, in my district in a long time, but traffic has continued to get worse and worse and worse. Parking has gotten worse. All the other quality of life things have gotten worse. And it's not because we're building stuff. It's because we haven't built things where people are, have a shorter commute or closer to where they work. Mr. Barnum. So we've had the unfortunate um, event of having major fires in this area lately. And imagine that you go outside on any given day, the smoke doesn't stop because there's a political line. The smoke is affecting each and every one of you because the smoke just goes where the smoke wants to go. And the same thing is happening with traffic and with growth and with water resources. We went through seven years of drought. And if you look further about the way we develop, we need to be able to develop smartly to deal with the resources that we have. And since, um, as Chappie said, everybody comes into this town from different places. And if you look at the statistics, they're amazing. Uh, it's roughly 10% or less of the people who uh, live in Cupertino work in Cupertino. Other cities around here have similar marks. So if you don't think we're interdependent, just look at that statistic. 90% of your neighbors are working outside of this town. Um, the worst circumstance, and I brought up the fires, but I'll bring up the thing we all know about, which is earthquakes and major disasters. When those things happen, if we haven't regionally planned, if we don't have arteries that allow us in and out, if we don't have communication and infrastructure for fire and police that can go between the boundaries and know what to deal with and are able to get to those locations quickly, the regional planning uh, part of it becomes really, really clear. And uh, so my focus is on what does planning do to uh, impact not only quality of life, but the entire infrastructure package so that we can all live comfortably where we are without affecting everybody else? Um, you know, I'll take a different tack here. I do think regional planning is important, but um, I also think local control and understanding the local community is important. And um, full disclosure, I, I work at Google. <laughs> Uh, whether I work there or not, I, I mean, I really appreciate uh, Google's efforts uh, around Deridon Station. And uh, so it's not so much a regional planning issue, but I think um, we need the jobs to be spread more evenly throughout the region. We have a lot of very large companies who are concentrated in Cupertino, Mountain View, Menlo Park. And, um, you know, if they're, for each one of those tech jobs, there's, there's Often three kind 
kind of support jobs or service jobs that go along with it. And um, if we could get these major employers to, I think, really focus more on San Jose and on the East Bay, the things that Chappie talked about, about, and he talked about as well, I mean, how many people are commuting. Um, you know, I really think the, as these companies have gotten so large, the benefits of collating these workforces is, I'm not sure the benefits there for the, for the company and it's uh, impacting the communities. So regionally, I'd really like to see uh, some of these bodies really talk about how we can spread uh, some of the employment centers. Thank you. Indeed, regional planning is not only about traffic. Oh, sorry, I cut you off. Uh, Mr. Pesenchu. Thank you. Yeah, um, I believe regional planning is very, very uh, important. And definitely uh, local jurisdictions, where I feel that we really haven't done enough. Um, the regional planning covers not just the housing, the transportation, but the water issue, the air quality issue. And the air quality issue, there is a Bay Area uh, Air Quality Management Board, which covers a little a larger region than like the transportation. We have the BTA, that's really Valley uh, Transit Agency, which only covers the Santa Clara County. And in Alameda County, the, the Santa Clara County bus doesn't go across the, 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 the county line. You know, so uh, in San Mateo, you got San Fran, uh, which you know, it's totally different than the 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 the, uh, the, the VTA. And then on the on the, the uh, East Bay, uh, we have the Alameda Transit District. They don't think to talk to each other uh, often, and they don't think uh, they don't really have a, a col collaborate uh, very well. So the VTA bus will stop at a, a Santa Clara the county line, and then if you want to go further up, you have to catch. The, 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 the bus from either the San Tran or the Alameda the Transit District. So it is very important and we, uh, I felt that we haven't done enough. Um, when, when, we, when I was on the San Jose City Council, um, we spent a lot of time to uh, do our uh, general plan. When, when I was on the council in 20, 20, 2012, we have already do, done the San Jose General Plan for 2040. But it would have a lot of local San Jose people involved with the general plan, but we didn't really reach out to our neighboring cities, or neither does any neighboring city citizens are interested to participate into our uh, general plan discussion. So it, I, in conclusion, I think it's important that we haven't done enough. Thank you, Mr. Ensign Chu. As you probably don't know, currently in the Bay Area, in addition to Bay Area, the Association of uh, Bay Area Governments, the San Francisco Bay Area has a Metropolitan Transportation <coughs> Commission, so-called the MPO, and Air Quality Management District, a Bay Conservation and Development District, a Regional Water Quality Control Board, mm -hmm. and numerous water, sewer, park, and transit districts covering portions of the region. Many of those single purpose agencies have come together at times within regional planning process, such as Plan Bay Area, following California's passage of SB 375, the Sustainable Communities and Climate Protection Act of 2008. So question number three, is a follow-up question from the uh, prior question. Since the regional planning approach is required for air quality, <coughs> water quality, transportation planning, development planning, and tax sharing, etc., which issue do you think, or issues do you think are currently the most pressing ones among the aforementioned issues. You can only use one sentence to answer. <laughs> um, once again, those issues are air quality, water quality, transportation planning, development planning, and tax sharing. Let's start with Mr. Bernhardt. If I 
have to pick one between water and, and, and air, I've got a problem. But I would say the development issue is the number one issue. Because whether or not we have the ability to have air and water are going to be defined by how much concentration we have in the cities. That's so, two sentences. Yeah, I was <laughs> <laughs> So I think regionally, um, transportation is the most complicated and difficult issue and the one uh, that needs uh, the most attention. Uh, and the state of legislature, I serve on the um, transportation committee and water committee. <laughs> I think that housing and transportation are linked and that they should be uh, approached in an integrated regional strategy where I, I actually I don't want to have a run on the city, so I'll just leave it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's uh, go to the next question. This is a three minute question. Since transportation or infrastructure planning, as well as housing development planning, are the most pressing issues, according to our panelists, and both are highly related to each other. We will focus on both issues in the rest of the first hour. So far, most regional planning agencies don't have direct authority over land use. Why shouldn't the general plans of the cities in the South Bay areas be coordinated? Let's start with Mr. Dobias. Two points. Two points. Um, three minutes. Three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so again, I really think that uh, local government um, understands the local community. And when you talk about general plans, uh, there are a lot of programs and policies that are really centered on that local community that I, I think a regional body uh, would, would not pay attention to. So I do think surrounding communities should uh, pay attention when general plans, comprehensive plans are being updated and submit comments and, and those concerns shouldn't be considered. Um, but I think it's such an enormous task to try to coordinate that you know, regionally. It would be extremely difficult. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, we talk about housing, we talk about transportation, there's so many areas that should be coordinated regionally. Um, um, you know, just one specific example, I'm, I'm the uh, head of the chairman of the Brown Committee in Palo Alto, we're looking at great separations along Caltrain. And a lot of what drives uh, the cost of that are the construction. And so if there was a way to coordinate construction regionally, perhaps even having a joint construction authority that could manage the funding and the construction schedule, it could actually save a lot of cities a lot of money. Um, you know, working along the rail, um, you know, very limited hours, you know, you work after midnight until four in the morning, it really breaks out the cost of these projects. And uh, you really want to have, I think, a coordinated approach. But right now, uh, most of the cities are looking at it individually and uh, it has the potential to drag out for a much longer period of time, which would impact count training and uh, drive the costs up for all these cities. So I think that's a good example where it does make sense to uh, coordinate regionally. Thank you. Mr. Kansen, too. Uh, I don't know if I will use up all three minutes, but I just wanted to reemphasize the importance of coordinate with your neighboring cities or the county coordinate with your neighboring counties because those issues um, uh, is very, very depending on the coordination between the different jurisdictions. Um, I'm trying to, or currently, trying to connect the, um, the, the 80 freeway and 680 freeway um, to avoid some traffic jam on both uh, freeway. And we picked uh, the, the Vision Boulevard in, in Fremont. In, um, not 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 in Milpitas. Could could, could choose the spot in Milpitas to do it. 
But <laughs> the fact that it, I was hoping was a study will, will, will uh, verify that. Once we get the two connections in, in Mission Boulevard and Fremont, you would relieve a lot of traffic from uh, uh, Milpitas as well as further up in, in the Newark Haywork uh, area. So uh, the solution, the cost may be burnt, uh, 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 varied by the, the, the Fremont taxpayer, the Fremont council, but the benefit will go across the, the whole uh, East Bay area. So the, the coordination and revenue sharing, is, I think, is, is uh, it's important to more the better. I definitely understand the importance of local control. Every city has their own unique needs. So for the city of San Jose, we have the need for to, to build out our commercial base so we can generate that tax revenue to provide the services that my residents are demanding. We also have a desire to get more employment closer to where people live. San Jose is an exporter of employees. To other surrounding cities, and so we have a, a unique need in terms of having shorter commutes and getting jobs closer to where people live. Other cities have different issues and different concerns. Their, their residents have different issues and different concerns. But I can assure you that uh, elected officials that I'm working with get it. So I mentioned earlier that I'm on a, a subcommittee that's looking at housing allocation among Santa Clara County cities in terms of how we can work together from a regional standpoint to be smarter about where we locate jobs and where we locate housing to be closer to those jobs, to address a lot of those issues that you're concerned about. I'm also, I also sit on the, uh, the board of uh, VTA, and so we're having conversations now in terms of working with other surrounding cities, particularly on the Stevens Creek Corridor, in terms of identifying you know, transit and transportation solutions that all the cities that are affected by it to work, come together, work together, and come up with a coherent strategy in terms of how we can build out transit on that corridor to address the growth that we're in, where that's taking place. Across the country boundary. So, I think the cities have to realize that there's differences, there's clearly differences between our cities. Uh, here in Cupertino, we, we just went through a whole round of, of elections and debates over the issues of whether or not we should restructure Valco Village, whether or not we should restructure some of the developments at the edge of our town. And those are somewhat particular to Cupertino, but they still affect out other cities. Whether you come to Cupertino in order to use our restaurants or our schools or whatever it is, you're going to enter the city because you want to enter the city. So there is local character to Cupertino and to San Jose and to all of the other cities. But the problem I see is, is that the parts that overlap are not addressed. And as a businessman, um, I don't think I've ever been approached uh, by a city to say, well, what is it that you're interested in doing in order to enlarge your business? What can you do uh, in order to work with us to attract jobs and create things in the city that fit the infrastructure needs of the city? So when we look at general plans, which is the question, um, we, we shouldn't only be looking at general plans with respect to what's inside the political boundaries of our city. We should be looking at them with respect to what can we do in order to attract the kind of businesses and the kind of needs that we have inside the city. And then we have to understand, as we've all said, that these things affect the other cities around us. In the event of an emergency, or when you get on the highway in the morning, or when you take your kid to school, you realize right away what those effects are. So I would create a coordinating council. What I think there is is no structure for doing that. There is, at the moment, extremely small amount of communication between the cities in the first place. Um, our moderator mentioned ABAG and the Metropolitan Transportation Group and the water bureaus. Even among themselves, they don't communicate very much on single issues. When we get into the larger issues, um, there's very, very little communication. And there's also a lot of interest that gets represented. So we need some sort of place, some sort of coordinating council that can look at at least the highest level things, transportation, housing, traffic, jobs, um, and figure out what points we can agree to agree on to begin with, and then come up with a, a way to share some of the information. Because I really doubt that members of the Los Altos City Council have shared with uh, Mountain View or with Santa Clara or the city of Sunnyvale has shared with Cupertino their general plan in order to get input on those things. And going back to my other subject, 
Go into those employers, go to your chambers of commerce, go to your business centers, and figure out where those people can be a resource for you and coordinate those structures. Thank you. Um, of course, we know that uh, we all... No, I'm sorry. Oh, you got it. Oh, Already said, yeah. Yeah, I learned my lesson. Yeah. <laughs> so as we know, uh, we hear a lot about coordination, but on the other hand, there's this issue of authority over land use. Local control want to keep that authority very close to their chest. And uh, regional planning or regional agencies, no matter how hard you try, you are a tiger without teeth because you don't have authority over land use. That's the di dilemma here. So my question uh, is, well, the next question is a three minute question. As we know, um, SB1 has already passed, and that will increase the uh, ta gasoline tax statewide very soon. And uh, SB1 will set funds, set aside funds for transportation funds. So how can regional agencies use transportation fun funding to shape or to influence regional land use, such as high density, development so that they can really come together and work out a plan. Let's start with Mr. Kensen Chu. The, uh, the author of SB1 is not here, but I know uh, uh, his representative is here. It's our local Bay Area Senate Senator Jim Bell. I was uh, also on the assembly <coughs> side because I'm on the transportation um, uh, committee. The SP1 is really trying to address the infrastructure issue. We're not, uh, we're not going to use the gasoline tax increase to build any new roads and new bridges. So it's just, just a matter of fixing what's already here, the existing roads and bridges that have uh, what kind of out of repair for many, many years to a point that it could jeopardize the, the, the safety of our residents. The detail is always, uh, the, the doubt is always in the detail. It was a good idea, you know, the, the governor, I may take more than three minutes on it because, uh, you know, the, 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 I was very uh, hands-on involvement with the, 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 the coming of SB1. It was really initiated by the, the governor. The governor serving on his last uh, legislative year term, two year term, so he will be out next year. Um, one, to, uh, two, two of his uh, uh, long time goal that he's been kind of putting it out until this time when he's out, of, you know, one out, one foot out of the door is to increase the gasoline tax. You know, the second one is the cap and trade. So we're not talking about the cap and trade, but we're concentrating on the gasoline tax. We have a lot of negotiation. This bill has, you know, we probably spent a huge amount, uh, amount of time on that to uh, discussing on the accountability. You know, when we increase the gasoline tax, how can we guarantee those money will be spent on the road repair? because the, the, the previous legislature seems to have a way to divert some of the gasoline tax for other purposes. So we, as a, 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 a state assembly, want to make sure that it's accountable. The money is, we will be spending on the road repair, not, not, nothing else. Secondly, the second issue that we spent a lot of time on was there are so many all electric vehicles out there. They contribute to the wear and tear of our local street and the bridges, but they're not paying a share, a fair share of the, uh, maintaining our local road and bridges. So how are we gonna you know, uh, uh, fix that? That's why the SB1, on top of uh, raising the 29 cents per gallon <coughs> for, the, uh, for, for the gasoline, the uh, gasoline tax, we're going to increase the your, uh, car registration fee. But it was uh, on a sliding scale, you know, through a lot of calculation, a lot of deliberation, uh, that we will 
you know, if you have a, a Prius like, like, like what I own, uh, come next year I'll be paying $25 more for the registration fee. But if you have a, a, a Tesla uh, or, or, you know, or, or all electric vehicle, you will be paying uh, $75, uh, $175 in registration fee. <laughs> So, and, that they, and then the, the biggest discussion is that, that okay, how are we going to spend the money? You know, we, we got a big pile of money coming to, to, to the state. And the final, um, well, I say final is really, not, 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 not what will we'll probably be more discussion on how we spend this money. But currently, um, the way it's going is that we go by the, the a mile of road in each country. So every country, you know, give us the number, say, well, we have a, you know, the X number of miles, per, and we divide that money based on the mile of the uh, road in each country, including the freeway and the bridges. So that's pretty much the SB1. So there's nothing really I can add to the discussion around SB1, but I would like to talk about the Metro B uh, mm, that have been right. passed that for, uh, it's going to generate $6 billion for transportation and transit. Uh, some is going to BART, some is going for, for other things, but that's really the funding vehicle for a lot of the things we're trying to do. Uh, this is really a classic chicken or the egg thing, uh, which came first, the density or the transit. And I, I've been in numerous debates with residents about before we can build density, we have to have a trans, transit in place. And it's, it's a dilemma. But one of the things that we try to do is be able to go to uh, VTA and say, we have a plan in place, which was our urban village plan, that has density. So therefore, we're, we're coming to you with this plan, so we want to see you know, your response in terms of what you can provide us in terms of, of transit and transportation, particularly going down the city of corridor. And I um, co uh, signed on a, um, a letter from the Mayor of San Jose, Mayor Cupertino, Council Member from Santa Clara, and, and, and myself, on a, a letter to VTA requesting that they uh, pursue a, a scope a, um, a study for the Stevens Creek corridor. Now, as well as the Lawrence Expressway, in terms of identifying transit that's going to be able to address a lot of these issues that you're concerned about. So that's kind of where I see the, the, the strategy in terms of we already have some, some uh, validity in terms of we've gone to the transportation agency. We said we have a plan in place, you know, so show us, you know, how you can support us in terms of being able to integrate transit and transportation in our high density urban villages. So I actually just had a meeting with, with VTA. They're gonna move forward with our, our, our letter of recommendation. And so we're gonna uh, just drive this, you know, to the fullest extent in terms of being able to, to get some of that money from Measure B as well as other um, measures that generate taxes. In fact, uh, one of the um, earlier transportation measures uh, was a, the original Measure A actually had Stevens Creek Boulevard identified as, as a location to, to, to put light rail. And uh, so it's, it's been a long time coming. We're trying to move that <coughs> forward. But I just want to let you know that part of the strategy is, again, justifying the transit to go along with the density. So back when I was on Planning Commission in Sunnyvale, we concentrated on the Golden Triangle. That was the um, boundaries between Highway 101, uh, 280, and 85. And remember, I was in Sunnyvale. So the idea was build your housing inside that triangle so that the uh, employment would be right next door. Same thing happens with transit. And it's, it's really too bad we didn't concentrate on transit maybe 25 or 30 years ago, but we didn't. And, um, we, our, our population density has grown so much in the Bay Area that now we, we need to revisit that. SB1 looks at the quality and the uh, repair of our roads and bridges, something which we believe should be okay to be deferred for over 30 years. 
Um, unfortunately, it's not really been a good thing to defer those things because our roads are crumbling and our bridges are falling. So um, I give a lot of, of, of credit to the Assembly for taking this step and the Senate for taking this step to, uh, to, to move forward on fixing those things. But the, the motions of transportation and the motions of repairing our roads have to go together. Recently, my road here in Cupertino was, was redone. It had been cracking up for years. And so they came in and they tore apart the road and they repaved the road and immediately thereafter they dug up the road to put water pipes back in that needed to be put in. And then they repaved the road and then the next sewer guys came in and tore up the road and did the same thing again. This is what happens when you don't communicate among the agencies. And when we talk about regional planning, um, I, I want to include our friends at the state because um, the state is, is uh, very much involved in this process and very much involved in the funding that will come into this. So why, going back to the question that was actually asked here is, how can we use those funds more efficiently to do the things that we need to do in transportation, to do the things that we need to do in repair and maintenance, to work on our infrastructure more efficiently? Well, imagine that there is a pot of money and it's not unlimited. And that a pot of money needs to be rationed out according to, in this case, maybe the number of miles of roads. But if two or three or four or five or 20 or 30 or 50 cities were to get together and pool those funds, and work together to make their transit uh, work, and work together to make sure that their roads were operative, and make sure that there's planning for fixing those roads not 30 years out, but instead every increment of five years down the road. The leveraging of those funds would make a huge amount of difference in regional planning. Mm -hmm. So, um, <clears throat> bunch of vehicles are here. Uh, autonomous vehicles are coming. Um, and I think the jury's out. And some models say that uh, traffic flow is going to be better with autonomous vehicles. Some say it's going to be worse. But I, I think the, the future of transportation is going to remain kind of a point-to-point on-demand network, whether, whether you own your vehicle or you subscribe to some kind of vehicle service. Um, and just the volume of vehicle traffic is, is so much greater than what we could reasonably build in a mass transit system. So I, um, you know, I'm excited about SB1. I think creating our infrastructure, you know, for clean vehicles of the future is going to be critical, um, and you know, it's going to be the lifeblood of our economy. So I think you know, a lot of times we spend a lot of attention on, on mass transit, on uh, TDM programs, and other kinds of things, but building, rebuilding this core infrastructure is needed. It's not going to go away. So, um, I just think it's a, it's a good thing to do. Indeed, uh, talking about uh, regional planning as much as we want to do, we still don't forget there's a state there. State legislature would put their power over us. Recently, not only the SB1, but also the uh, passage of SB35, which is streamlining the development project approval process. Uh, many local city officials, mayors, city council members feel that their powers are taken away by the state because of SB 35. So my next question is a three minute question. And uh, the question is, are the California state mandates for housing allocations such as low cost uh, housing, housing to jobs ratio, and housing to distance traveled to work, etc., in line with regional housing development. Are these mandates, such as SB 35, taking away local government's authority in land use? We'll start with Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones? I'm going to actually yield my time to you. Um, I was actually going to yield uh, some of my time to Sonny Min Chu because he uh, can really speak to this much better than I think the. But he's lobbying me. So don't get him off the hook so easy. Well, that actually ties in. It's like we're working together because that ties into the point. I, the one point I did want to make is that um, obviously housing and this housing crisis is, is more than just. A, a Bay Area issue, it's a statewide issue, and a lot of cities, not just you know the ones around here, but a lot of cities in California 
their uh, lawmakers have been very resistant to approving housing. And so a lot of housing has not been built because the, the resistance from the local uh, uh, government to build housing. And so as that's taken place, the housing crisis has gotten worse and worse and worse. Housing costs have gone through the roof. Housing affordability has is, is, is been diminished. And at the state level, they recognize that if we don't do something to address this, and we leave it up to the local uh, government, then the problem is going to continue. So, you know, there have been uh, elected officials, you know, I put myself in, in that category, who have been, you know, out front in terms of my desire to see housing <coughs> built and, and, and participating in these types of events. Uh, sometimes, it's, you know, it's uncomfortable, but I've been very forthright in terms of my desire to, to see housing built. Uh, I think there are elected officials that will look you in the eye and say, you know, I'm going to do everything I can to see that there's no new housing that's being built. But, but secretly, you know, I think that they were happy to see SB 35 pass because it kind of took them off the hook. And um, so I think, I think there just needs to be a, a, a very honest discussion that housing is going to be built. That we have to build housing. And if not, this growth, growth is taking place. You know, your children are being born. People are coming in here for jobs. You know, immigrants are coming in, in here for work or to be re reunited with their families. And so growth is, is going to happen. So how do, we, how do we manage it? And so the whole purpose around SB 35 was to take a lot of that, that those roadblocks and resistance that, that was happening at the local level and, and, and take it out of the local government's hands in terms of being able to stop projects that are potentially good projects that need to happen. So I'm going to leave it up on that note, and I'll let the assembly member Chu really elaborate on that. You we'll almost take up the whole three minutes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next up, uh, Mr. Parker. I'm not going to be so civilized. Um, my my response to this is, is that the state can't uh, mandate the outsourcing of responsibility. The same problem exists between the state and the local um, towns and, and counties. That is, that there's a gigantic gap in communication. Certainly, we need housing. Uh, we, we need housing probably in every major uh, portion of the state of California, but we don't need it in the same place, in the same way, across all of the state of California. And one of the things SB 35 does is it reduces the um, entitlement process that local governments have and the ability to get around CEQA and other environmental impact reports and to do away with parking requirements and to do away with a lot of the locally necessary things that many projects have, and that's dangerous. It's dangerous because individual cities have a better meter on their needs and what happens in their city than the state does. Which is not to say the state shouldn't be involved in the process, but I have a serious issue with us outsourcing responsibility um, and, and creating, uh, instead of just removing the roadblocks that enter from building housing, by introducing new ones um, that, that are trying to level out California to be all the same across all of the areas. We're not the same. And there's different needs between the Bay Area, there's different needs between the Central Valley, there's different needs in Southern California, and even within the cities and counties of the Bay Area, we have very different needs. And going back to what Sunderman Chu said earlier, when there's a bucket of money or when there's a bucket of responsibility, there has to be accountability. And that accountability has to be at the local level, it has to be at the county level, and it has to be at the state level. And if they're not coordinating amongst each other for these things, it's not okay to just snap your fingers and say we need housing and build it. You need to know what's the impact on the roads, what's the impact on the schools, what's the impact on all of the infrastructure matters that will affect this area. Um, San Jose is developing a, a Stevens Creek corridor, a, a larger density Stevens Creek corridor. And I think it's a great idea to look at new places to build and new opportunities on a major thoroughfare. But does the state understand that plan versus the other plans that are being done in the area? Has San Jose cooperated with Cupertino on that plan because the streets go through the same cities? And so my look on this is that if we're going to look at housing needs and we're going to look at transportation needs, it shouldn't be a top-down approach. It should be a shared approach. And there needs to be a mechanism put in place for us to communicate better on those. You know, the way I think about housing, there's, uh, there's new development, and then there's uh, 
existing residents who are living in the town. And you know, if you look at Mountain View, I think the median price for a one bedroom apartment right now is three thousand dollars. And um, you know, that's that's one bedroom, and that's just that's just not affordable for a lot of people. And in Mountain View's building probably more important, more apartments than the North County than almost any other city. Um, and so you look at that, and we're kind of in this boom, boom town environment. Um, and uh, you, you know, I think you have to you know, really have to step back and think, okay, what's driving this? And in Palo Alto, it's not it's not an interest in a non interest in building housing. It's that office development is so lucrative. Um, it's pushing out kind of all of all of their uses. And so what we've been trying to do in Palo Alto is look at ways to kind of shift the, the focus. Um, and uh, like, I, you know, I'm very supportive of the idea of changing some of our mixed use definitions to more retail and residential instead of retail, residential, and office. Because we get these projects that have very minimal retail, they have three stories of office, and they have two penthouses on top, and that's just making the problem worse. Um, I also recently introduced in Palo Alto a proposal to have increased renter protections. And again, this is for people who are living there to be able to deal with kind of huge spikes in rent. Um, and unfortunately, it wasn't, wasn't supported by the rest of the council, which I think was a mistake. Um, but as we look at these new initiatives from the state that are mostly centered around new construction, I think we really have to think about how do we protect existing housing and how do we maintain some economic diversity um, with people that live in town so that the rents don't go up so much that they're you know, forced to move somewhere else. Um, the other thing you know, we've been looking at in Palo Alto is below market rate housing, and we've, we've raised uh, the impact fees on office development. I personally thought we should raise them even more, um, but we're really trying to generate funds where we can do some saving of below market rate housing projects. Mr. Kansen, should oh. Thank you. I thought it was going to take more time, but uh, I agree with uh, everything that's being said by this uh, distinct panelist. There was a void out there. See, if you guys, uh, local uh, jurisdiction, local election officials, do your good, do your job, uh, we don't have to worry about those things. And and in state level, and press going down to the uh, the, the local. Um, I, I also want to take this opportunity to. Uh, that was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> I also wanted to take the talk. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, to recognize one of our uh, Santa Clara City Council member, uh, Teresa O'Neill, over there on the corner. And I, I saw, I know that uh, my counterpart, and my colleague Evan Lowe, is in Taiwan promoting or celebrating thanks same-sex marriage, but his staff, I saw one of his staff, Patrick, is, Patrick. Patrick was there. Okay, well, he left here. Anyway, so um, housing, uh, <coughs> uh, SB 35. Just because those local councils, you know, supervisor, they didn't do a good job in, and, 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 and it made the housing become such a big problem. I want to address the the, the, uh, the the local control issue. You know, any developer here? You know, when I was on the South Bay City Council, I heard so much complaint from the developers. The, the local are taxing for school impact fee, you know, uh, housing in, uh, impact fee, the park impact fee. There's tons, tons, tons of uh, uh, fees and, and, and taxes that they have to pay. That. SB 35 does not address that. So the locals, you can add up to, you know, whatever you like was a limit to uh, get some more money from the uh, from the developer. We we look at the city planning, like I mentioned earlier. We usually look at uh, 40 years out, you know, and um, Chucky mentioned about the problem that we have in San Jose. Is because back b b before the Proposition 13, the leadership, you know, but this is in the 70, 40 years ago, the leadership in San Jose was so much enjoying the, the in uh, property tax increase on residential properties. 
they shy, they shut out a lot of the uh, industrial and commercial to, to the city of San Jose. Because at that time, more than 85% of the revenue is from property tax in San, San Jose. But when I was first elected to the council um, in, a, 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 in 2014, no, two, in 2007, um, we are less than 50% revenue are from the property tax. Uh, and so we all of a sudden rely that we need to re rely more on the sales tax to be able to balance our book. And, and, and that's why we have uh, an industrial land protection policy. We so, say, well, do we identify the industrial uh, parcels and we're not going to, uh, to build any houses on, 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 on top of that. So, so that's what the issue was the, the, the city of San Jose. And that, that's really um, a, a, a issue of the long-term plan. You know, it's very difficult for any one of us to be able to see uh, what would happen in, in 40 years. Uh, and, and that's why when I make a lot of decisions at the San Jose City Council or in the, in the state legislature, I always keep my grandkids' pictures in mind. What am I doing here? You know, uh, do I protecting? Do uh, am I do, making the decision so they can live in in, in the uh, in, in the neighborhood when I'm ready to retire? Could they be able to find a job in in, in, in the area they grow up? You know, I'm we seeing the increase of the the, 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 the cost of a living. We see the increase of the rent and the cost of a, a, a housing. You know, would, I would make, make me wonder if they'd be able to stay at the, the area where they grow up. So addressing the housing issue is very, very important, not just to me, but to most of the legislatures in, 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 in Sacramento. At the beginning of this year, we have 300 plus, I think, if I remember the number, the number correctly, 350 bills trying to address the housing shortage in, 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 uh, in, in California. As we're speaking right now, there's 4,000 people in Santa Clara County, just in Santa Clara County, 4,000 homeless people. And you don't, don't think those homeless people are those bumps you know, are, 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 you know, a drug addict. They are in, in the, 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 the high school that I, uh, we have in the east, uh, the east side uh, high school uh, district. There are 28 students are homeless. There are a lot of uh, 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 women trying to abuse, uh, uh, trying to avoid the domestic abuse, and they just pack their back and, and, and leave their house to avoid the, 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 the domestic abuse. So there's a big um, a gambit, you know, a relatively big gambit of the homeless uh, uh, the homelessness issue. A lot of the, the people that I know are working on two minimum wage jobs and they still cannot afford a, a, a roof over their head. And that, that's why they become homelessness. So the, so the housing issue, it is really, really, should be on everybody, every legislature, le every elected official, every every one of Californians' uh, 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 mind. We start out with 300 some uh, some bills trying to to address it, but we consolidate and we narrow down to probably less than 30 bills. You mentioned about the uh, SB 35. That's just one part of the housing bill that we. Uh, we uh, uh, passed, and also very fortunate to be able to sign by the, uh, our governor. I was a real intensive, intensive negotiation, because this work, this governor is very frugal. He doesn't want to, to uh, he, 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 he wanted to reduce the, our state debt, which is really a good thing. But we wanted to be able to help the local jurisdiction with some 
uh, a, a low income or below the market income housing. So one of the idea is to stay, issue a statewide bond to help the local jurisdiction of uh, maybe some matching fund to build more housing. And we start out with uh, uh, eight billion dollars. You know, I don't know where we get that number, but it's whatever the, the, the number but it, it, it was, it's not enough. So we start out with an eight billion dollars. We, if the state can do an eight billion dollar bill about to to be like in, in a matching fund for the local jurisdiction, we should be able to put a little dent on on the uh, uh, the, the, the housing issue. And uh, so. Did the governor end up uh, negotiate down to a four billion dollar bond? So you did. this is another thing you will see on your next ballot uh, movement. It's part of the uh, uh, housing issue. We try to address the housing issue from three to three prone approach. One is to have a steady funding source for uh, for building the um, affordable housing. Uh, and uh, so we have a, a bill that will charge $75 recording fee every time you do a, a, a refinance. You know, that's, I think that was SB2 by Senator Atkins. And, and that will, uh, that will uh, uh, generate roughly $250 million a year. And the second one for the, on the revenue side is to pass that that that, uh, that bond, four billion dollar bond, so on the, on the revenue, and also we wanted to uh, have the accountability, which is uh, where that uh, SB thirty five uh, came in. We we know that uh, closer to home uh, in Brisbane, there is a, 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 a housing development that that really passed all the rules and regulation in the, in, in the local city. You know, all the teed across, I dotted, but the city hold them out. You know, have, have a, a moratorium to say, well, okay, you're, you're all done. You know, everything. you know, through this is about nine years of, 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 of working with the city. You know, they got everything, every, yeah, all the key dots, the all key cross, I dotted, but the city will not allow them to build. So we. What city was that? Brisbane. That was uh, um, in Brisbane. So, so we were trying to streamline the, the permitting process, you know, and uh, um, with little caveat to say, well, um, if, 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 if we, if, if they f uh, fulfill a minimum uh, uh, requirement, Okay, we, then the city should not um, hold them back. So that was pretty much the SB 35. And streamlining, streamlining the, the process is, is always good. And again, the city still has a way to impose fees and, 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 and taxes to generate revenue uh, from, from them. So, so, so the, st the steady income, the revenue source, uh, and also the um, uh, uh, accountability uh, and, and uh, uh, this the kind of the two uh, uh, prone appro approach that, that that would take. And um, you know, again, it was part of uh, the, the housing bill, I think. And the end of the day, we have about thirty bills consolidated from three hundred something. And SB 35 just look just a part of the bill. Thank you, Assemblyman Kensen Chu, for your detailed explanation. Um, we're right on time, and I will conclude the first uh, hour of forum with uh, the last question, which is uh, very relevant to my office. Um, as you know, I come from uh, Fremont Unified School District, and SB 35 would uh, put a challenge. Uh, to us directly, because uh, Fremont is overdeveloped, our schools are busting the seams, and we have a hard time finding money and space to host all the students. However, talking about the original planning as much as we do, I realized that none, none of the original planning agencies 
include local public school officials. So my last question will be easy one and a short one, and it's a yes or no question. <laughs> Do you think we should include public school officials in the regional planning agencies, starting with Mr. Uh, Bernard? Yes. <laughs> yes. Mr. Kenson Chu? Oh. In theory, yes, but I'm hoping that the, <laughs> the, the, uh, the council member should also have a reading of the pulse of the local uh, jurisdiction. Uh, the board peer, you know, somebody was just asking me the difference between serving on the San Jose City Council and in the state assembly. My quick answer is that when I moved to this assembly, I, on the city council, I only have to count up to six. But when I move to, to the assembly, I need to learn how to count up to 41. So you could have, yeah, you could have, you know, and, and it's a good idea. All, all the concerned citizens should be sitting on the board. Yeah, but you, you, you have to have people that understand your district, can uh, have really either years on the, on the road to represent you to those meetings. Not how many people <laughs> in the meeting. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Yes, and uh, you'll probably uh, laugh at this too, but I actually have a, uh, a policy of not answering yes, no questions, it's just no, because <laughs> the issues that we deal with are so complex. Yeah. And just for an example, so in the city of San Jose, we have 19 school districts. So out of those 19 school districts, how do you identify, which have various different needs. So the Fremont Union School District has different needs than the East Side Union School District, which has different needs than the San Jose School District. How do you I pick one school district that's going to be the, the spokesperson or the advocate or the vote for, for 19 school districts? So it's, it's more complicated than a yes, no, but uh, as a representative of the city of San Jose, it's my responsibility, my obligation to work as closely as possible with the school districts and the school administration to advocate and speak for their, their issues and on their behalf. Thank you. That ends our first part of the forum. Before we uh, go to the second part, which is the open Q&A session, uh, I would like to recognize some of the uh, additional elected officials oh. that are among us. Larry Klein from Sunnyvale City Council. <laughs> Lydia Cole from uh, Palo Alto City Council. Patrick Akron, representative from Evan Lowe's office. <laughs> Stephen Schaff from Utino City Council. <laughs> All right, so uh, we will have a microphone uh, in the front. So people uh, who want to ask questions, uh, give questions to the panelists who we'll line up and ask questions. And uh, typically, uh, this is a Q&A session, not a platform for you to give a public speech of your agenda. So uh, I, I understand people appreciate that if you just ask questions. You and you, you could uh, please uh, limit your uh, question to at most one minute. And uh, once you finish asking the question, please uh, take the answer while you sit down. We do that because we don't want this to become a dialogue, hence a debate or a fight. Uh, so 